Hello everyone and welcome to this part 2 of the neural network series. In this video I'll introduce you the idea of gradient descent which underlies not only how neural network works and learn but how a lot of other machine learning works as well and what those hidden layers of neurons end up actually looking for. So just to remind you guys that our goal here is the recognition of the handwritten digits and these digits are rendered on a 28 by 28 pixel grid each pixel with some grayscale value between 0 and 1. Those are what determine the activations of the 784 neurons in the input layer and these activation for each neuron is in the following layers is based on a weighted sum of the activations in the previous layer plus some special number called the bias. Then you compute that sum with some other function like the sigmoid or a relu function. And we also discussed how a perceptron works and behaves like a function. Obviously the perceptron isn't a complete model of human decision making. But what the example illustrates is how a perceptron can weigh up different kinds of evidence in order to make decisions. And it should seem plausible that a complex network of perceptron could make quite subtle decisions. In this network the first column of perceptron is making very simple decisions by weighing the input evidence. What about the perceptrons in the second layer? Each of those perceptrons is making a decision by weighing up the results from the first layer of the decision making. In this way a perceptron in the second layer can make a decision at a more complex and more abstract level than the perceptron in the first layer. In total given that somewhat arbitrary choice of the two hidden layers with 16 neurons the network has about 13,000 weights and biases that we can adjust and these values that determine what exactly the network you know actually does. So here we are going to learn how the network learns. What we want is an algorithm where you can show this network a series of training data which comes in the form of different images of handwritten digits along with labels for what they are supposed to be and it will adjust those 13,000 weights and biases so as to improve its performance on the training data. Hopefully this layer structure will mean that what it learns generalizes to images beyond that training data as well. Now we'll use the MNIST dataset here which contains tens of thousands of scanned images of handwritten digits together with their correct classification. The MNIST names comes from the fact that it is modified subset of two data sets collected by NIST which is the United States National Institute of Standard and Technology. The data comes in two parts. The first part contains 60,000 images to be used as training data. These images are scanned handwritten samples from 250 people. Now the second part of the MNIST dataset is 10,000 images to be used as the test data. Again these are 28 by 28 grayscale images. What we would like is an algorithm which lets us find weights and biases so that the output from the network approximates to the desired output of all the training inputs. Now to quantify how we will be achieving this goal we define here a cost function which is sometimes referred to as a loss or an objective function. Here the W denotes the collection of all the weights in the network, P denotes all the biases and is the total number of training inputs. For us it is 60k and A is the vector of outputs from the network when X is the input. And the sum is over all the training inputs which is the X. Of course the output depends on the values of X, W and B which are the inputs, weights and biases. Now the cost becomes small that is the function c tends to 0 precisely when y of x is approximately equal to the output for all the training inputs x. So our training algorithm has done a good job if it can find the weights and biases so that the cost is equal to 0. By contrast it's not doing so well when we say that the cost is large. So the aim of our training algorithm will be to minimize the cost as a function of the weights and biases. And in other words we want to find a set of weights and biases which makes the cost as small as possible. We'll do that using an algorithm known as the gradient descent. We are just going to initialize all those weights and bias totally randomly. What we do is we define a cost function as a way of telling the computer what is good and what is bad. To do this we need to add up the squares of the differences between each of the given outputs which are the given activations and the value you want them to have. And this is what we call the cost of a single training example. This sum is small when the network confidently classifies the image correctly. Now so the aim of our training algorithm will be to minimize the cost as a function of weights and biases. So then what we do is consider the average cost of all these tens and thousands of training examples. The way it's defined depends upon the network's behavior over all the tens of thousands of the pieces of the training data. That's a lot to think about. 
How do you find an input that minimizes the value of this function? For the most part, making changes to the weights and biases won't cause any change at all in the number of training images classified correctly. That makes it difficult to figure out how to change the weights and biases to get improved performance. If we instead use a smooth cost function like the quadratic cost, it turns out to be easy to figure out how to make small changes in weights and biases so as to get an improvement in the cost. So for now, we are going to imagine that we have been simply given a function of many variables and what we want is to minimize that function. Those of you from the calculus background will know that you can sometimes figure out that minimum explicitly. A more flexible tactic is to start from any old input and figure out in which direction you should step out to make the output low. Specifically, if you can figure out the slope of a function where you are, then if you are shifting towards left, then the slope is positive. And if you are shifting towards right, the slope can be negative. It will be the reverse. So if we do this repeatedly at each point, checking the next slope and taking the appropriate step, we're going to approach some local minimum of the function. But that's not always feasible for really complicated functions. Now, really complicated functions can have a lot of minimas. There is a beautiful analogy which suggests an algorithm which works pretty well. We start by thinking of our function as a kind of a valley. What we do is we imagine a ball rolling down the slope of the valley and our everyday experience tells us that the ball will eventually roll to the bottom of the valley. Perhaps we can use this idea as a way to find the minimum of the function. Now people familiar with multivariable calculus will know that the gradient of a function gives you the direction of the steepest accent. Basically, which direction should you step to increase the function most quickly, naturally enough Taking the negative of that gradient gives you the direction to step that decreases the function most quickly. The algorithm for computing this gradient efficiently, which is the heart of how a neural network learns, is also known as backpropagation. So this process of repeatedly nudging an input of a function by some multiple of the negative gradient is known as the gradient descent. You'll see in our network an adjustment to one of the weights might have a much greater impact on the cost function than the adjustment to other weights. So if we take a particular cost function, suppose 6 by 4 x square plus 2 by 4 y square. So this is just a simple example. Now what we do is compute its gradient at some particular point. Then what you can say is that the changes to the first variable, which is 6 by 4 x square, has three times the importance as the changes to the second variable. The gradient of the cost function is one more layer of complexity that still tells us what nudges to all these weights and biases cause the fastest change to the value of the cost function. So when you initialize the network with random weights and biases and adjust them many times based on this gradient descent process, how well does it actually perform on images that it's never seen before? Now, if you play around with this hidden layer structure and make a couple of tweaks, you can get the accuracy up. Now, I just think there's something incredible about any network doing this well on images that it's never seen before, given that we never specifically told it what patterns to look for. Now, here we tackle backpropagation, which is the core algorithm behind how a neural network learns. Now, what is backpropagation? It is the actual algorithm which makes all the learning possible in a neural network. Basically, it's an algorithm for computing the complicated gradient. The magnitude of each component here is telling us how sensitive the cost function is to the weights and bias. Now, let's say you compute a negative gradient and the component associated with the weight on this edge here comes out to be 4.5, while the component associated with the other edge comes out to be 0.1. The way you will interpret that is the cost of the function is 45 times more sensitive to changes in that of the first weight. So if you do a change in the first connection, that would have an effect on the cost, which is 45 times the change you made on the second connection. The cost involves arranging a certain cost, for example, over all the tens and thousands of training examples. For now, we're going to focus our attention on one single example. So let's take an example of the digit 5. What effect should this one training example have on how the weights and biases get adjusted? Let's say we are at a point where the network is not well trained, so the activations in the output are going to be pretty random. Now, we can't directly change those activations. We only have the influence on the weights and biases, but it is helpful to keep a track of which adjustment we wish should take place to that output layer, and since we want it to classify the image as a 5, we want the 6th value to get nudged up while all the others to get nudged down. Moreover, the size of these nudges 
should be proportional to how far each current value is from its target value. For example, the increase to that number 5 neuron activation is in a sense more important than the decrease to the number 7 neuron, which is already pretty close to the zero mark. So there are three different parameters that can team up together to help increase the activation. You can increase the bias, you can increase the weights, and you can change the activation from the previous layer. Now, of course, we cannot influence those activations. We only have the control over the weights and biases. But just as with the last layer, it is helpful to keep a note of what those desired changes are. Now, these changes are being made only for the digit 5. We also want all the other neurons in the last layer to become less active and each of those other output neurons has its own thoughts about what should happen to the second last layer. So the desire of this digit 5 neuron is added together with the desires of all the other output neurons for what should happen to the second to last layer. Again, in proportion to the corresponding weights and in proportion to how much each of those neurons needs to change. This right here is where the idea of propagating backwards comes in. Now, once you have the idea of all the nudges you want to make to the second to last layer, you can recursively apply the same process to the relevant weights and biases that determine those values, repeating the same process through and moving backwards the network. Now, remember that this is all just how a single training example wishes to change each of those weights and biases. This network can only classify a 5 as it is changing its value to classify 5 better. So what you do now is go through the same back propagation routine for every other training example, recording how each one of them would change the weights and biases and you average together those weights and the desired changes. Now this collection here of the average changes to each weight and biases is proportional to the negative gradient of the cost function. It takes the computer an extremely long time to add up the influence of every single training example, every single gradient descent step. So guys, I hope you got an idea of what exactly a gradient descent is, how it works, the various parameters involved in the working of the gradient descent, and how backpropagation handles all the changes to be made to the weights and biases, which ultimately tells us how the neural network is learning and modifying itself to have a better accuracy. Thank you guys. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!